thing. I've always, well, when Hitchcock ran this picture privately for Ben Heck, the writer, when the lights came on in the projection room, and you saw the scene just now of the jacket and the stitches going and the sleeve. Ben Heck's first remark to Hitchcock was, he should have had a better tailor. <laughs> that always conditioned my reaction to the scene. Because every time I saw that happening, I thought of Ben Heck's remark. <laughs> But uh, I'm always, always impressed by Hitchcock's laying out of that scene, by his construction of that scene in a cinematic way, which is almost a perfect lesson if they're going to send kids to school to become directors, to watch how a story is told. And uh, interestingly enough, when I first came on the set, uh, which was stage 12 at Universal, and the largest stage, and the hand of the Statue of Liberty is built exactly to scale. Uh, I came on, and I had never been on a movie set before, coming from the theater, and Hitch said to me, would you like to see the Statue of Liberty scene? And I thought, what does he mean by that? I said, yes. And he summoned the assistant and said, bring me the scene. And he brought him a scroll. And Hitch had drawn the whole thing, every cut. He had prepared every cut. He had drawn every cut for that scene. Which was a way he had of working when he got into very complicated movie terms. Right, and now... Nowadays, there are a number of directors who do this, and they, borrowing the animation term, they call it storyboarding. But it was very unusual then, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And uh, he, he did, when he had a, a scene between two people, such as Priscilla Lane and myself, in the crown of the statue, he didn't do it for those scenes. Those scenes he just blocked with the actors. Mm -hmm. But when we, when he got down to the complication of the mat shot and so forth. Now, you know, there are so many great aspects to a Hitchcock picture from a directorial point of view. But underlying all his cinematic <coughs> skill was his basic, extraordinary ability to tell a story. He was a born storyteller. As a matter of fact, if you ask him, is he doing a picture, he'd say, well, my next picture is, and he would tell you the whole story, beginning, middle, and end. <laughs> and I was in a restaurant with him once when he started to tell me the story of one picture, and in the middle, he couldn't go on telling it, and he said, right there and then, before he ever shot the picture, he said, I'm in trouble. <laughs> if he... He had a theory which is, if you can tell it, you can shoot it. If you can't tell it, you can't shoot it. And you know, I subscribe to that theory. So, it, it is wonderful to get the storytelling thing. And one of the big points, major points, which I think you would appreciate from a story point of view is, his insistence that I fall, finally, I go, from a big head close-up and no cut. So that the audience could have said, oh yeah, great, yeah. They cut away and somebody else did all that. You never cut away. He was on this big head and the body went. And I bounced back. <laughs> and, and I don't think I don't think movie artists had ever seen a shot like that before. I don't think anybody had executed a shot quite like that before. Uh, as as in so many of his films, he he innovated visual ideas, and that was one of them. Certainly, that's a great visual effect. 
Today we take those kind of shots for granted, but not then. Yeah, that's it. Um, now, most, most people know that you had a long association with Hitchcock later on. But how did you get cast in this role? Uh, Hitchcock was under contract with David O. Shelsnick. And uh, the vice president in charge of uh, international affairs or something, David O. Shelsnick, was John Houseman. John Houseman had been uh, the partner of Orson Welles in the creation of the Mercury Theatre. And I had the good fortune to work in the Mercury Theatre uh, in their first two productions, which were Julius Caesar. Thank you. Julius Caesar and Shoemaker's Holiday. And so as a consequence, I got to know Jack, John Houseman, and uh, when we all went our way after the Mercury, and John Houseman ended up as his vice president of Selznick Pictures, he got to know Hitch very well. Hitch admired him very much, as did I. And when Hitch was preparing this story, he asked him if he knew of an actor who was unknown. He wanted a new face to be this saboteur. And uh, Jack Houseman recommended me. And as a consequence, I got it. I did have to test, but uh, I knew in my meeting with Hitch that if I didn't fall down during the test, I was going to get that far. <laughs> Figuratively speaking. What? Figuratively speaking. Figuratively, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, so how did you, uh, how did you re rejoin the Hitchcock camp a decade later when, when he and Joan Harrison went into the television business? Um, previous to that, I had done Spellbound with him. Oh, that's right. And, and uh, it was during Spellbound, which as you know was about psychoanalysis, that there was a famous psychoanalyst as advisor on the picture. Her name was Mae Rong. And she became increasingly disturbed by Hitch's liberties with the whole question of psychoanalysis. And she would voice them. And that's when he said his famous remark, it's only a movie, May. <laughs> and it became a famous rub. It, it, it quoted as, it's only a movie, fellas. Yeah. But that's where it happened. Well, uh, time passed, and I began directing, and uh, directing in the theater down at La Jolla, and also uh, some down at La Jolla, and also uh, some television and so forth. And Joan Harrison was a friend of mine, and I would, would see Hitch on and off for lunch. It really wasn't anything to do with work. And uh, then they started the series in 1955. And at that time, they used to do 39 half hours a season. And at the end of two years, the Hitchcock Company, known as Shamley, named after his country place in England, the Hitchcock Company got an order for another series to do with the half-hour Alfred Hitchcock Presents. Or the, and this was an hour show. And I established something of a reputation as a director, particularly at La Jolla in the theater. And it was then that uh, Joan and Hitch got the idea to take me from that and put me on to help her with suspicion. And that's how it happened. And in the course of that, we started to do the series. And while we were doing it, it was Joan, who, by the way, uh, uh, he was a wonderful producer, and really I learned to produce from working with Joan. She had had experience doing it, and successfully, and was 
a superb producer, had a great story sense, very beautiful lady, and I learned from her about producing. And then she urged me to start directing them. So I ended up doing about 28 of them, I think. And uh, even acted in one or two. <laughs> you've, you've, done so many, you've done so many different things. Uh, acted, produced, directed, written. Uh, 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 you, you, of course, uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one here who used to watch Saint Elsewhere every week. <laughs> You know, you've you've spanned such a, a, a broad spectrum of, of film and television and, and, and theater. Uh, does it does it bother you in any way that sometimes the things people mention first about you is that guy hanging off the Statue of Liberty? That's a very astute question. <laughs> very accurate, because you know, a friend of mine who is a first class director named. Alexander McKendrick. Alexander McKendrick. Sweet smell of success, amongst others. Those wonderful pictures he made in England at uh, Elk Street. He once said to me, uh, uh, precisely on your question, he said, it's funny how one becomes identified through one's whole career with the very first thing you did. No matter what you do after, you're identified with that first thing. And so, I have to say, am I. <laughs> Good or bad, that's the way it is. <laughs> but you don't, you don't seem to resent it. No, no, I don't resent it. It's, <laughs> as long as people look at the picture again. Yeah. <laughs> and did, you, did you hear the gasp? When you fell over the railing, that I mean, that's a 1942 movie. We're so uh, uh, overloaded with with visual effects today and with all sorts of action and tricks. But when you fell over that railing, people gasped. You mean the backflip? Yeah, that's interesting because I see it right before me now. A hitch approached me. I would say he was because he was going to ask a question. He said, uh, would you have any objection <laughs> to going over that railing? I said, well, Hitch, how high, how high are we? He said, oh, well, that we'll take care of, but do you think you could go over that backwards? He said, because I want to be on a close shot of you so that there was never any question that it was anyone but you who went over that back with that backflip. So I said, yeah, yeah, I'll do it, Hitch, I'll do it. Now, what they did, the, the, as I told you earlier, the hand and the arm was built to scale, exact scale of the statue. As a consequence, we were up high, so they built parallels up to within about four feet of the railing. They laid mattresses on these parallels. And on the queue, with a close shot, I did the backflip and dropped about four feet below the camera level onto the mattress. And I still remember the grip who was there to prevent me from rolling, because I would have kept rolling and rolled off those 14 or 16 feet high. And he stopped my roll. And that's how it was done. Of course, I was very proud of my athleticism. <laughs> Say, well, how'd you do that? I said, tennis. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was it was playing tennis that that uh, really got you to meet Charlie Chaplin. Wasn't That's it? right. Could you tell us about that briefly? 
Well, uh, Charlie, amongst other things, was a tennis addict, as indeed I am. And we had a mutual friend, Tim Durant, who brought me up there one day to play tennis with Chaplin. And as a consequence, that developed into more than tennis. We became friends and actually were going to collaborate on a picture. We owned a property together. But when Charlie was cut off in the middle of the ocean and told he couldn't come back without passing a moral turpitude test, and he said, I'll never make another picture in America, that was the end of our property because it had to be made here. And we dropped the whole idea, but we, for 16 years, we owned that with the idea of making it. But Charlie said something once on the tennis court that I always identified with much of his success. I mean, he was a genius. Incredible. And he had... So one isn't going to go to, into the chapter and verse. But he had a wonderful attitude. And one day we were playing tennis in the days when we could play singles. <laughs> and in a given game, he began to run up a lead. And he was in, within a point of winning that game. And lo and behold, I won a point. Now he was within two points of winning it. And I won the next point. Now he needed to win two more points to win that game. And it wasn't going to be as easy as it was when he had won every point in the game. At that moment, he had the need to walk to the back of the court, to the base. And lo and behold, I won a point. Now he was within two points of winning it. And I won the next point. Now he needed to win two more points to win that game. And it wasn't going to be as easy as it was when he had won every point in the game. At that moment, he had the need to walk to the back of the court, to the baseline, to pick up a ball. And I heard him muttering to himself, speaking to himself. And I edged up to the net because I wonder what, what was he talking about on the court. And I heard him say to himself, by way of urging him to win this game. Charlie, take all the success you can get. And that's a marvelous attitude. <laughs> he won the game. <laughs> he followed his own instructions. Right, yes. Uh, uh, the how do you how do you choose what question to ask next? Because uh, uh, we don't have we don't have very much time. In fact, we have almost yeah, well, yeah. well, you you've 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 made you've made television and films in recent years, and I'm not going to ask you to compare the good old days, present day, anything like that. But what I am interested in knowing is uh, how you see uh, if you see continuity in the craft of filmmaking. Do you see progress? Do you see people learning from the past? Do you see uh, 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 you know, a divergence from, from the lessons learned in the past? Now, the last director you worked with on a major feature was Curtis Hansen, who's been here this weekend introducing films. There's a director who does value and prize film history, and I think it's in his, it's in his DNA, and, and he, he applies it. Uh, uh, because Norman is in his film In Her Shoes with Cameron Diaz. A very good part, too. Uh, and if you haven't seen that movie, it's a darn good movie, and, and Norman's got a great part in it. Uh, uh, being on the set of that film, is it just like being on any set? Is it, is it, is, is it a set in the 40s 
Any different from the set in 2006, 2007? In my view, there is a difference. When I look at a John Ford film, and I see The Grapes of Wrath, Ford Apache, or My Darling Clementine, etc. I get such a sense of story, of a beginning, middle, and end, and of the people in that story. And I get such a sense of emotion coming off the screen. Henry Fonda in that last scene in The Grapes of Wrath, there's no greater scene in movies than his acting. I'm talking movies, I'm not talking about mm -hmm. some, some, etc. For my own part, today, since it is a style, not to tell a story beginning, middle, and end, but in a kaleidoscopic fashion, so to speak, <laughs> where a lot of technicalities overwhelm the telling of the tale, where the directors of the new generation seem to me to fall in love with the equipment. <laughs> <laughs> terrific sound cuts, jump cuts, and so on. Now, Dee Dee Allen, whom I knew when she was in a, just running the sound off stage in a play I was in once called Valpone, she is responsible, supposedly, according to obituaries, she died last week, with introducing this European method of cutting and so forth. Well, you can't fault that, except that it has changed the nature, for me, of what I see coming off the screen. I don't get with it. I observe it. But I don't get pulled into it as I did with the other pictures I mentioned earlier. I mentioned Ford because he was as great as we had, but there may be others. I mean, for me, Jean Renoir, what he does with people on the screen is Incredible. It's like a great novelist. And indeed, a couple of his scripts are literature, more than they are screenplays. Grand Illusion, that's literature, that script. So, yes, uh, to me, there is a difference from when I started. Uh, the, the attitudes. I'm not going to mention any pictures, but I am really surprised when I see some pictures today made by the newer people to think that they even got a green light to make that story. <laughs> I'll never work again. <laughs> Do you still enjoy the process of, of acting when called upon to act? Once an actor, you're always an actor. <laughs> you can direct, you can write, you can produce. You're always an actor, if you started as an actor. And I don't care who it was. If they'll be honest, they'll tell you that. Uh, I can tell you that those of you who live here in Los Angeles, next Saturday afternoon, uh, you, uh, May 1st, May 1st, you can see Norman act as part of a tribute to Norman Corwin, the great radio dramatist, at the Writers Guild Theater. Uh, he and a, a fine company of actors will be performing, and I just saw them do, it's a radio, it's radio acting, radio plays, and I saw him perform with William Shatner and Sean Astin in a radio play last year, and uh, not because he's sitting here, I'm telling you, he was great. Uh, that was in Ray Bradbury's Leviathan 99, and it was a great piece. Uh, uh, so I look forward to seeing you act again next week. And Norma, we can't thank you enough for coming out today. Hey.